Sports Car Nation, the hobby is the people. Weekly news and interviews, it's your number one source. Sports Car Nation, the hobby is the people. Sports Car Nation. What is up, everybody? Episode 119 of Sports Car Nation. My name is John Newman, and I am always happy to be back with the Hobbyverse out there, right? The hobby is the people. That's all of us, and uh, got a great show. And, you know, I do share a lot of some of my personal stuff. Well, not everything, but I do share some of the stuff that, that happens personally uh, in my personal life. And, uh, you know, we have a guest today, um, and this is uh, uh, it's all good. We we got it done, but it was on the third attempt to record this interview. On the first attempt, uh, this gentleman uh, was a little bit under the weather, so we had to reschedule for a couple days later. And a couple days later, my wife called me from her doctor's appointment and said, "Hey, my car's gone." I'm like, "Your car's gone? Yeah, where I'm out in the lot where I where it should be. It's not there." And you know, if you're familiar with medical buildings, right? Uh, sometimes. Sometimes you you know you got four or five different entrance ways where you can park different you know A lot B lot C lot and I'm like hun did you go to the the wrong end exit and you think your your car should be there but it's in a different lot she said no John it's it's this is where I parked and my car's gone and I'm like well if that's the case and you're sure you got to call nine one one right some someone took your car apparently you know uh and uh, so it was two blocks from from where I live so I got in my car and zoomed right over. I got there before the sheriff's department even did, and sure enough, on the ground, broken tinted glass, and my wife's car was stolen. Uh, you know, not a Mercedes, not a Beamer. Um, it was a Kia, and uh, I guess Kias can be hotwired easier, making them a target for car theft. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, 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 we don't have the car back yet. It has been recovered. Thankfully, the only damage was the window smashed out and the ignition ripped out, so that's going to be fixed, and she's going to get her car back. Uh, it was found 100 miles away in Rochester, New York. We're in, in Syracuse, and uh, crazy stuff story right and that was uh so why i i mentioned that story is that day that happened i was scheduled to interview my guest that we have on on today's show and i had to make a phone call and say this is going to be the weirdest phone call you'll probably get but i can't do the interview my wife's car was stolen uh and uh, so we rescheduled. It you know has a happy ending. Cars recovered, not trashed, not burnt on fire, not flipped over. Uh, Going to be fixed, and that's what insurance is, is for. And we have the guest on today's show. So uh, I haven't named him yet. You're probably like, well, who is this guy that you had to you know on the third try, right? It's uh, Mr. Brian Dwyer, president of Robert Edward Auctions and uh, you know started as a six-year-old worked his way right up well worked at SGC then the Robert Edward Auctions and then uh, eventually up to the president's row. We're going to talk about all that. We're going to talk about the auction market, uh, and we're going to talk about uh, the hobby and 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 all sorts of stuff. So uh, glad to have, glad to finally get him on. Uh, we got it. We got it all worked out, and uh, still appeared on the right episode that we had planned. And so uh, we didn't have to reschedule the episode uh, itself. So uh, great guy. Happy to have him on. Happy to have uh, REA as the official auction sponsor of Sports Card Nation as well. So. So with all that being said, uh, you know, I don't want to steal the show from you. Let's uh, let's get the show started. Time for our hobby is the people announcer of the week. This is David Keppel. Remember, the hobby is the people. If you'd like to be the hobby is the people announcer of the week, do a WAV or MP3 file and send it to sportscardnationpc at gmail.com. For more than 30 years, Robert Edward Auctions has been the nation's premier auction house specializing in sports memorabilia and trading cards. With significant experience and expertise in all major sport, non-sport, and Americana collectibles, REA has helped clients achieve record-breaking prices for their items and has done so with a reputation for integrity and transparency. 
By actively partnering with collectors and enthusiasts throughout the entire process, REA has created the hobby's most trusted forum for selling high-quality collectibles. Go to robertedwardauctions.com for more information on how to buy or sell in their next auction. Real excited to talk to the next gentleman on the Sports Card Shop guest line. Uh, they're the newest sponsors to Sports Card Nation uh, as well. And uh, I don't want to I don't want to make them wait with with a long intro. But the uh, president of Robert Edward Auctions, Mr. Brian Dwyer. Welcome, Brian. Thanks for having me, John. Good to be here. So. We, we got a lot, you know, we got a lot to talk about, but it, it, I know it's the boring kind of standard podcast question, but uh, I know you got your start like me very young. I believe you were, you were six kind of talk about your, your, you know, your journey uh, into the hobby, where it started and, and sort of that uh, timeline, if you will. Yeah. So, you, so you're absolutely right. My, my origin is not too dissimilar from a lot of people that are in this hobby. I got my first pack of baseball cards as a six-year-old and I opened them up and for some reason, reason. Uh, thankfully, I just became enamored with them. And so my parents kept feeding that obsession and it became baseball cards became a very logical, natural gift for me to get at birthdays or Christmas or special occasions. And so, you know, as a very young child, I was getting tops cards. I was building sets. I was sorting them by name and player and team. And uh, it was about when I was 12 years old that I got my first taste of vintage. Uh, my dad was in an antique shop and found some early 50s Bowman Brooklyn Dodger cards and he picked them up and he brought them home and that just kind of set the wheels in motion about who were these guys why are they why do they look so different than the cards that I'm collecting here in the 90s and uh, and that really kind of started me on this path towards vintage where I've been you know for the last 25 years or so so um, very innocuous start. Got a pack of baseball cards to probably keep me quiet as a six-year-old. And, and here we are. Yeah, no doubt. And um, a man uh, after my own heart with, with vintage, you, you know, we all know there's obvious reasons uh, why I like it. It's just, uh, you know, it's harder to find, obviously. And, uh, you know, with different uh, generations of, of ball players, And it's something that, you know, as a dealer, I, I still set up at shows and I do have modern. Uh, but it, when it comes to like my PC, you're definitely going to see a lot more vintage vintage there than than not and uh, uh for for obvious reasons so uh, i know you worked at uh, sgc before uh you know heading to the the, the auction uh, house route uh you know what did your time at sg i mean was it a good primer for what you do now was it a good segue absolutely i consider sgc to be the best experience i've had in my professional career i mean i i, I started there as an intern i actually got college credit for working at sgc which uh, was amazing. I was very lucky to go to school only about 20 minutes from their headquarters. And uh, it was a crash course on everything hobby related. You know, uh, these grading companies, they're grading Donruss, they're grading Pokemon, they're grading T206 Wagners. So I got to see a little bit of everything. I got to meet dealers. I got to meet collectors. I was fortunate enough to travel to trade shows in the US and Canada with SGC during my time there. And so, uh, you know, I spent a, about three, three and a half years there learning the ins and outs of the grading world. And, and I loved it. And I missed the buying and the selling, which is how I ended up going the auction house route. You know, when you work for these authentication companies, there's limits that are placed on how you can buy and sell, obviously, because you're supposed to be a neutral arbiter. But um, but yeah, absolutely invaluable. Still do a lot of business with SGC to this day. And I think they're a great company. And, and I look back fondly on my time there. Yep. And and uh, obviously right now you're, you're you're the president of REA. Talk about kind of your, your you had a similar uh, start there. You kind of started and, and worked your way up uh, into the position, obviously, uh, you're in now, you know, if you want yeah. to go through that. Yeah, absolutely. So when I left SGC, I did so because like I said, I, I missed that buying and selling. I was very active on eBay when I was in high school and college. I loved the idea as a kid growing up in upstate New York, I could buy and and sell with guys in Florida or California or, or you know Texas, whatever. And so I, I really wanted to scratch that itch. And this was 2010. And at that time, there really were only two options if you wanted to sell cards. You could do it yourself on eBay, or you could go to these big auction houses that produce these big, large catalogs, and 
and they catered to $10,000 and $100,000 cards. And so I looked at the landscape and I said, there's nobody that's really offering the best of both worlds. There's no one that's providing an auction house experience to people with $500 or $1,000 cards or even $100 cards. And so I started a company that uh, did just that. You could consign your cards, you could have that auction house experience, you could have the presentation. And we started everything at $10. And so we'd have items that went for, you know, 12, 15 bucks. And then we'd have items that went for $50,000. And uh, I did that for about a year and a half until I caught the attention of the founder of Robert Edward Auctions. And at that point in time, they were doing one auction a year. They had two employees, um, one auction a year. And uh, he, he wanted to expand. And uh, he saw the writing on the wall that one auction a year wasn't sustainable. And I tell people I had a very good thing going with my own company, but it was like the Yankees called. And they said, hey, we're playing the Red Sox tomorrow. We need you to start in center field. Do you, do you want to join? And, and here I am playing minor league ball. And so I jumped at the opportunity and I sold my company, which actually still operates to this day under that um, new ownership. And I came to work for REA. And uh, that was 2012. I started um, as an acquisitions director. I was responsible for bringing in material. I did a lot of uh, operational processing, writing for the company at that time, and then and in 2016, I took over as president and uh, hard to believe, but seven years later, here I am. And I love it. We have 23 employees now. So we're, we're much larger than when I joined yeah. and we're doing, uh, last year we did 12 auctions. So uh, really expanding the offerings and, and bringing the best of REA to as many people as possible. Yeah, no doubt. Hey, let's take a quick break, but we'll be right back with Brian Dwyer from Robert Edward Auction. Okay. Everybody, have you heard about Collectible? It's the one-stop shop where any collector can buy and trade affordable shares on some of the world's most rare and valuable sports cards and memorabilia, starting from just $5. For a Mickey Mantle 1952, PSA 10s, Will Chamberlain's iconic rookie uniform, to 101 Patrick Mahomes RPAs, rare LeBron James logo mans, and everything in between. Collectible creates never-seen-before access and opportunities for all. Let's enjoy the hobby we love together. Please note this is not a recommendation or solicitation to buy any security. All investment decisions should be undertaken after doing your own research. Welcome back. Let's return with more with Brian Dwyer. Like you said, in, in seven years, uh, it, you've grown the company exponentially, employee-wise, uh, offering-wise, more auctions, uh, all that uh, great stuff. Kudos uh, to you uh, and, and your team uh, as well. Uh, you know, one of the questions I get asked and I can't really answer, and, and, and I've thought about, it, you know, with other auction uh, plat, you know, houses and what, uh, how, how competitive is, is that? Is, is there communication? Uh, is it? You know, is it cutthroat? Is it it's somewhere in between? Kind of, you know, you don't have to mention names per se, but, you know, kind of that landscape. How how does, you know, for those that don't know and wonder, uh, like some people have asked me and, and I've wondered myself, uh, you know, how, how does that go? Yeah. So, look, there's a lot of companies that are holding auctions. There's a lot of opportunities to consign your cards to various auction companies. Um, I think it is very competitive. I think within our sphere of kind of close competitors, we, we have this friendly rival, right? So the hobby's small enough where we all know each other. Um, we all want to win, but at the end of the day, we're all setting up at the same trade shows. We're all going to the same conventions and we all have to see each other. So, you know, it's it's not cutthroat in the sense that I, I don't talk to my competitors or I, I speak ill of them, but at the end of the day, we, we all want to win. And, um, you know, we have, we have different specialties than maybe some of our other competitors. Um, we have tremendous relationships that, that help of us draw in incredible material that maybe our competitors don't have. So the, the fortunate thing for us is that there's a tremendous amount of t material to go around. And, uh, you know, uh, just as I can speak for our business, it's been growing very steadily because of the quality and the caliber of the product and the service that we're able to offer. So very competitive landscape, but I think we do a lot to differentiate ourselves. And I think that, uh, 
you know, the, that that comes out in our results. I think our results is really what earns us a lot of our business. Yeah, no doubt. We've seen, you know, we've seen the market kind of, you know, calm down, uh, reset a little bit, uh, you know, with what's going on, obviously, in, in macroeconomics. Yet, you no, know, at that higher end level, we're still seeing records uh, be broken. We're still seeing yeah. very strong sales. Um, obviously, one of the obvious reasons is if someone's, buy, you know, spending that kind of money, they're sort of uh, less effective let's say to what's going on economy wise and in you know real world time stuff but uh, what else maybe attributes to that strong you know it's it can't be just that i'm sure that's a, a big factor but what other factors is why that some of that upper echelon is still so strong uh, yeah i mean i think i think it really comes down to quant uh, quality and availability so i think a lot of the people that are playing in that realm understand that if you want something that is super rare, uh, whether it's a condition rarity or, you know, just just uh, supply is low, you have to strike when you have the opportunity. And so we're seeing items that are coming up for sale and, um, you know, they're, they're getting record prices um, because that might be the only opportunity you have. And so social media is an example of the opportunity that the industry has to kind of showcase those items and really make sure that people are aware of these very rare items that are coming up for sale. And, uh, and then the, you know, the companies and even the collectors themselves sometimes can trumpet those numbers. And, uh, you know, I, I think it really just comes down to, to opportunity. People recognize that you may not have another opportunity to get some of this material and you're going to have to strike. Yeah, no, no doubt. And uh, that's obviously uh, one of the reasons it's, it's strong. We've seen the freight, you know, the last few years, we've seen fractionals kind of uh, make some headlines, you know, uh, kind of your thoughts on that. Does, does that hurt what? you do is it really don't affect either way like what's what's the place in the hobby for that and what's your thoughts on it yeah so i i think fractionalization actually has a home in the hobby i think it's a very interesting um opportunity for some people who you know can't go out and write a hundred thousand dollar check or even a ten thousand dollar check um to participate and to to claim ownership on some of these very rare and special items as far as whether or not it affects what we do uh no i mean i think it accentuates what we do because you're going to have potentially some collectors that are that are auction averse or, or risk averse and you know they would never consign their items to an auction but they they can go to a fractional platform and they can stipulate their price, they can stipulate their terms, and they can have that uh, that measure of security. So I, I think it's an exciting time. I think it's still in its infancy in our industry. I think it's uh, more developed in some other collectible classes. But uh, no, I, I, I like it. I like the idea. I like the premise. Um, and I'm excited to kind of see how it plays out over the next couple of years. Yeah, no doubt. I've dabbled in it uh, a little bit. Like you said, it's a great opportunity, probably a card I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be able to afford it in full and you know in a, just a funny sort of way bragging right say hey i own a very very small percentage uh, of this uh, one of those cards is that uh, well it's now off uh, off the fractional market but was that uh, the baltimore news uh babe ruth uh, uh there yeah. that so it's just a you know it's kind of fun to say yeah uh, you know uh, an infinitesimal uh ownership in a in an icon iconic card and uh for that for that realm and uh you know it uh, it's uh it has its uh a place and uh you know there's there's you know if you do it right you can even make a few bucks in in the process if that's you know where your mind your mindset is time to hear from one of our great sponsors but sports card nation will be right back after that <laughs> For nearly 50 years, Sports Collectors Digest has been the voice of the hobby, bringing you comprehensive coverage of the sports collectible industry. From industry news, auction results, market analysis, and in-depth stories about collectors and their collections, Sports Collectors Digest has everything you need to know about the hobby. SCD is also your leading source for listings of sports collectible dealers, card shops, card shows, and the latest from the industry's top companies. To check out all the latest news or to subscribe to the hobby's oldest magazine, visit sportscollectorsdigest.com or call 1-800-829-5561. Let's go! You are listening to the Sports Card Nation podcast. You guys just had a, a great, uh, you know, talk about winning. You guys just had a great January uh, auction, kind of uh, 
you know, kind of, re- you know, recap that some of the items, uh, what they, uh, you know, what they brought. And then we'll get into even the what's going on with February. There's a little time left even to for those that want to get in their their last minute bids. But uh, kind of recap January's auction for, for REA, which was tremendous. Yeah. So that was our first Encore auction of the year. And for anyone that's not familiar, these Encore auctions are uh, held seven or eight times a year. They are held in months in which we don't have one of our premier cat catalog auctions. So this January auction um, had some great items in it. It had a Jordan Fleer rookie in a nine that brought almost 20,000. It had a a 98 Peyton PSA 10 rookie that brought over 10,000. It had a signed 52 tops maze that brought over $15,000. So uh, great high quality, high caliber items. And um, what I think the encores are most known for, and the thing that excites me most about them is the variety. You know, you're going to get five figure. We've even had multiple six figure your items in those auctions. And then you're going to get that, that, uh, you know, 56 tops common and an eight for $40 that that set builder needs. So, uh, usually 3,000, 3,500 lots to choose from and a tremendous variety. Um, the February auction, like you mentioned, it closes this Sunday. Um, another great auction and a lot of, a lot of highlights in it. We've got a Chamberlain rookie in a seven. We've got, uh, uh, 53 mantle in a six. We've got some rare back T206s. We've got just a lot of good quality Mantle, Ruth, Garrick, Jackie Robinson type cards that um, are available this month. So um, should be should be something for everyone. I mean, uh, there's tickets in there, there's photos, there's autographs, there's there's a wide variety of stuff. Yep, and if you're listening to this on, on show release date Friday or, or soon after on Saturday, uh, you still got time left to, to head that way and uh, get those uh, last minute bids and maybe uh, pick up something uh, really nice. You know, we've seen, uh, we've seen the market sort of change some things. You know, uh, I think I'm a little older than you, Brian. I remember when I was younger, you know, and people got autographs on on sports cards, right? It was like, never have the rookie card signed. You're ruining it, right? You're writing on the rookie card. It's, you know, it's it's not worth anything other than, than the autograph. But we've seen that sort of opinion uh, change, and autograph rookie cards are a huge deal. I mean, there's there's a dealer at the sh- at the National and, and whatever other, that that's all that's in, in that gentleman's uh, showcases. And yep. we We've seen obviously prices of these uh, reach their own astronomical marks, and so what once was sort of uh, frowned upon now is a, a huge uh, collectible uh, market. Why? Why do you think that's that sort of changed? I remember being younger; and it was always like use a second year card or use a, another card other than a, a, a rookie year card. But obviously uh, now, especially on the vintage side, uh, it's it's completely you know went the other way. What do you attest to to the to that sort of opinion change in, in, in the hobby. Yeah, so I think the hobby kind of looked at the data and realized how tough it was to get these signed rookie cards in really high grade. I mean, the combination of a perfect signature on a perfect card um, is quite rare. And, and you know, you've got even modern players like Ricky Henderson or Ken Griffey, where getting a 10-10 is, is, is not an easy feat. And so I think the hobby looked at the data and looked at the population reports and said, okay, this is worthy of paying a premium and I can't replicate this myself. And not for nothing too, these players are charging a um, considerable amount of money to sign anything, uh, especially compared to 10, 20, 30 years ago. I mean, I grew up going to shows in Westchester County, New York, and you know maybe the highest, the highest fee you'd see for an autograph was $20. And now you're getting, uh, I saw someone say that Patrick Mahomes is expected to come out at fifteen hundred or two thousand dollars for for wow. his next signing. Um, so you know, I think the hobby's looking at this and saying, okay, it's the the rookie cards have appreciated in value. The players have wised up; they're charging more for their signature. Um, and then the combination, it's tough to replicate, so it's it's worthy of a premium. Yeah, no doubt. It's it's something you know you forget about, but you made a great point with you know what these uh, athletes charge you know for appearing uh, at a show or private signing even and, and putting you know their autograph on whatever 
you know, whether it be a card or a piece of memorabilia, uh, those numbers have, have increased as as has the demand uh, for them. And uh, like you said, I, I remember those same shows, right? 20, 30 bucks, you know, uh, almost, you know, no matter who it was, the 30, 40 bucks was the, the bigger star and 20 bucks was the, the lesser star, if 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 you will. And uh, uh, times are, are obviously different now. Like you said, the players, you know, the athletes see what some of this stuff's going for on the secondary mark and you can't really blame them with that being the case to say hey you know let me get a a bigger piece uh, uh, of, of the pie it's time for a quick break but we'll be right back hi this is pat hughes cubs announcer coming to you from the sports card shop in beautiful new buffalo michigan the gocher family has built an incredible place here for collectors to buy sell and trade cards and memorabilia be sure to stop by and let them show you around the sportscardshop.com connecting sports athletes the hobby and collectors around the world <laughs> Sports Card Nation has returned. You mentioned tickets too. That's something I'm I'm starting to get into uh, myself. I think it's really a. Uh, uh, you know, I don't want. I don't know if undervalued the right is the right word, but I, I think they're underrated for for sure. Because yeah. when you think, you know, when you think, I was a, I still am a sports guy. I was a sports kid. Would go to baseball, football games, and right, you get, you go, you, you know, this is before now. They now there's now hard copy tickets are actually few and far between. They got to kind of scan your phone, but uh, you know, back then you you had that hard copy ticket, and uh, you know, they either just they, they looked at it or ripped a, a, a you know a quarter section off you crump you kind of just put it in your pocket once you got kind of to your seat it gets all you know crumpled up later on you, you know you get home and most of the time you where's it wind up right the trash game's over you got in you saw the event and so i think a lot of these tickets and I, I, i'm assuming you'll agree you know a lot of these tickets don't exist they were just thrown out uh, after the events over people you know they weren't viewed at in the same respect even as a trading card at least a trading card had that in- intrinsic value. Hey, I can trade with my friends. It has my favorite player on it. The ticket was just a, a ticket or means to get through the gate to your seat and yep. watch the event. Once that was over, you kind of threw it away. And so when you when I see these tickets, you know, it's if there was thirty thousand people, let's say at that event, how many realistic, how many tickets realistically survived that day's event? So when you when it become even and even if it was like a no hitter or something like that people still didn't know you know think that i'm going to save my ticket some people uh did obviously but but uh, not in the same vein we would uh today and so i think tickets in a way are, are even scarcer than 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 cards on, on some levels just because people aren't thinking of them in the same vein and so i i think the ticket market um I, and more people i think are, are thinking like this because we've seen that market get hotter and, and prices uh, get higher and demand get higher just uh your thoughts on on the auction side with with the ticket market and that sort of line of thinking. Yeah, no, you're 100 percent right. I mean, I I'm I'm very similar in the fact that I would go to all these events as a kid, whether they were shows or concerts or or games, and I, n- I never saved anything. I mean, the 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 memory of being at the game was more valuable, more important to me than the piece of paper that let me get in. But you're right that the hobby has started to realize, and I think it goes back to what I was talking about: looking at the data, looking at the 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 supply of these things, and say, you know what, these are these are not insignificant, and uh, and they're tough, and how many of them could really exist? You know, debuts have become a very hot part of our industry. We sold a Mickey Mantle debut for six figures. Jackie Robinson's debut has sold for six figures. Uh, Jordan's debut has sold for six figures. And then even lesser guys, you know, we got nearly $20,000 for Roy Campanella and Pee Wee Reese's uh, debut in, in our last auction. So uh, it's very exciting. I think it reminds people of some of these significant events that they were either at or wished they could be at. Um, and we're seeing it even transcend into modern. You know, we have in this spring auction coming up a ticket from LeBron James's first game in Los Angeles. So he goes into LA as a rookie. And now 20 years later, he's breaking the all-time scoring record for LA or, you know, with, with LA. So, you know, it's kind of an interesting full circle um, ticket that I think will, will really draw a collector's attention. Um, we've sold tickets to Wilt Chamberlain's hundred point game for, for $20,000 or, or more. 
summer. Um, and, you know, that's something where it's an iconic event. People talk about it. You see the pictures of Wilt holding the ball that says 100. And, and uh, how many people really saved their tickets? I mean, we've seen a dozen, maybe at most. Yeah. Um, so I think they're very cool. I think it's an underappreciated part of the hobby, but I think it's caught a lot of attention recently. I think the uh, some of these big prices really do help shine a light on it. And uh, yeah, I mean, it'll be interesting. And I think it will be interesting to see how it how it continues to evolve, given that, like you said, teams are not producing tickets anymore. So, you know, people are scanning them on their phone, they're getting, uh, they're getting, you know, swiped in. Um, and there's there's no such thing as a hard copy ticket. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how that develops. But I think you're right. I think ticket collecting is, uh, is something to keep an eye on. Yeah, no doubt. And you made a great point with like a lot of the, those debut tickets, right? The first appearance of that athlete uh, on the professional uh, level. In a sense, they become rookie cards, like an additional type of rookie card attached to, you know, you mentioned like a Mano debut ticket. We all know the 51 Bowman. And now you have sort of the ticket equivalent of a, a 51 Bowman uh, with a, a debut ticket. It's sort of like if I'm a Mantle collector, uh, I'm going to, you know, and I can add that along with a 51 Bowman, I probably already hopefully own, uh, you know, that would be, a, a, you know, you're getting, I think, crossover right you get people yeah. who who maybe never ha- thought about even collecting tickets like hey i, I would have never thought of, i'd be doing this and here i'm buying my favorite player or my idols debut ticket because it it means something you know it means something to me to own it have it on my desk or wherever you know you might keep yeah. it uh and, so and, and it was there right i mean especially yeah. in, the, in these ticket stubs i mean maybe full tickets you could argue might not have been at the game but you know Jackie Robinson makes his major league debut. That ticket was in the building. So it's a very cool uh, spin on these really iconic moments. You are listening to the Sports Card Nation podcast. We'll be right back after this break. Introducing the only auction house dedicated exclusively to the cards of the 1990s. Josh Adams and John Linden have created an auction company solely for the rare, scarce, and hard-to-find inserts and parallels of the 1990s. Whether it be basketball, baseball, football, or hockey, 90s auctions will have it. Each auction will consist of smaller lots between 100 and 120 lots so your cards won't get lost in the shuffle. Founded on the principles of fairness, honesty, and integrity, 90s auction was created by collectors for collectors. Register and consign today at 90sauctions.com. That's 90 little s auctions.com we are back I'm a Jackie Robinson guy growing up in, in Brooklyn, even though, you know, uh, I, you know, my dad lived in Ebbets Field. Uh, you know, I'd love to uh, be a t- uh, not not in the budget, but uh, be an item I'd love. You know, I always joke if I would. Someone asked me, John, if you ever won like the, the Powerball or the Mega Millions, what what item like in the hobby that you can't buy now would would you put on the list and and that one would uh, probably uh, make it but like you said how many of those really exist you, you don't even see them that often uh you know the, I, you're getting into that single double uh, double digits i think rather than uh you know more uh with cards where you you know hundreds or, or thousands of them so it's i just think it's a market that i think more people uh who maybe you know you have all the cards of your favorite play you have the run but now you want some historic maybe a historic home run game the debut ticket right you can actually start to fill in other holes so you get that sort of crossover i think yeah. uh w- with that you know so we'll, we'll see we'll see it's gonna be fun uh fun to watch uh you've handled obviously some iconic uh car just to speak to to some of those uh that uh you know off the top that stick out off the top of your your head well, I mean, it's 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 uh, hard not to start with the, the the granddaddy of them all. So we we sold in uh, August of 2021 the uh, the T206 Honus Wagner graded a three by SGC for what was then a world record for a sports card, six point six million dollars. And you know, the T206 Wagner, obviously one of the most famous, if not the most famous, cards of all time. It's a card that REA has been privileged to handle more of than anybody else currently active in the industry. 
Um, and we've set records along the way for 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 the T206 Wagoner when we've sold. We we've been very fortunate in that respect, and it was uh, very special to handle that that 6.6 million dollar one. Uh, about a year and a half ago. Uh, Baltimore News Ruth, you mentioned earlier that you had participated in the fractional ownership. I mean, we've handled uh, not all of them, but nearly all of the ones that are known at some point in time. We've handled the more common, but still not super common. Uh, Sporting News Ruth Rookie, um, you know, we sold a PSA 7 four or five years ago for $600,000, which at the time blew away the record. And now today that would be a two and a half, three million dollar card. Um, so there's been a lot of great stuff that's that's passed through here. 86 Fleer Jordans we handle by by the dozens. Uh, 52 Mantles are always special. It's a card that means a lot to me. You see it over my shoulder. That's yeah. a card that I grew up idolizing. Um, you know, we 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 handled the the best E93 set of all time, and we broke it last year for nearly two million dollars. Um, and then we handle cards that people probably have never heard about, but they're they're very rare, they're very cool, um, and and they're 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 special for us. You know, when when we get that call, uh, we just recently got a call from someone that had a, a trading card from the 1860s that we've never seen before. So you know, getting that in, doing the research, getting it authenticated is very fun. Uh, we break up T six sets all the time, Gaudi sets, uh, Cracker Jack sets that come from collectors or non-collectors. So we're really fortunate that there's there's almost nothing in the trading card world that hasn't passed through here. It's funny. I was going to ask you, is there something that you haven't, uh, you know, uh, auctioned or, 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 you know, been involved with? Is there like a, a, something that stands out, man, I would love, you know, for REA to, to offer that. Is there something that sticks out or, or not necessarily? Well, so, I mean, my my wish list right now is uh, the Baltimore News Ruth. I mean, I think that it's been um, a number of years since the Baltimore News Ruth has hit the open auction market. And I think the next one that will sell will rewrite the rewrite the records. Um, so that's a card that you know I would love to have the opportunity to put up for auction. There are some very obscure cards that if I named, probably nobody would ever uh, even recognize. But, you know, as a trading card nerd, I think about, oh, I've never handled that I've never seen that. Um, but, you know, T206 Wagners, Ruth Rookies, um, those are the ones that we want to be involved with. Those are the ones that are always special and uh, any grade, you know, we, we love the opportunity. Yeah. You know, uh, I want to ask you, you know, an expert opinion, if you will, on, on the Baltimore news, you know, you hear two different people kind of talk about it. You sort of get two different opinions about how many of those uh, exist. Uh, there's some that claim, you know, there's more the T206 Wagners in existence than uh, that. Uh, yeah, you know, I've heard someone else say they think there's a little bit more than sort of being advertised. Like, where do you like, obviously it's all speculation, right? No one exactly knows but i mean where do you think the 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 pop count is as far as existence on a card like that again it's it's an opinion you know no one knows entirely for sure but what's your gut i guess tell you on a card like that yeah so i mean i believe that there are fewer than a dozen baltimore news ruths that exist we can confirm about 10 of them um i i believe that there may be uh, other ones that are out there lurking but then i think back to myself uh you know 10 12 years ago we were selling that card for four or five, six hundred thousand dollars, which at the time was just an unheard of amount for a baseball card. And so we were publicizing that we were getting uh, recognition for how for how incredible those prices were. And we we didn't draw any new ones out. So that's not to say that it can't happen. We've seen obviously instances like the Black Swamp find where the pop counts are rewritten and the Lucky Seven find with the Ty Cobb, Ty Cobb back uh, for the T206. But, you know, I'm of the opinion that there's five or six times as many T206 Wagners as Baltimore News Ruths. That being said, the Wagner benefits from the the, the prestige and the allure and the folklore and the notoriety um, because of how well known it is that the Baltimore News Ruth just just doesn't have unfortunately yeah and you you make a great point that's that's exactly what it is it's i mean the the wagner's a card that even people maybe not in the hobby see and kind of know it, it's a significant uh item yeah. uh, where maybe the ruth is just doesn't have that familiarity but i think like you said i think if there's going to be a, a new record holder it may be a baltimore news uh, roof that uh that does it and hopefully it's uh rea that's uh, uh handling that and 
stuff get, gets it done. So uh, I appreciate you you giving some time, sharing some of your your insight uh, with the listeners today, Brian. I, I give all the guests, uh, you know, take as much time as you need. Uh, give out website where people can see what you guys are doing, bid, uh, social media, all that, uh, all that good stuff. Yeah, so we're available on all the major social media channels. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok. We are always previewing upcoming auction items. We're showing new finds. We're showing some behind the scenes stuff. Uh, so I think anybody that's into the hobby and kind of seeing how auctions are built would get a lot of uh, enjoyment and entertainment out of following our social channels. Um, right now, we're working on uh, closing out that February auction like we spoke about earlier. That closes Sunday night at 9 p.m. So anyone that wants to pop on the website, which is Robert edwardauctions.com. They can check out the 2,500 plus items in February. They can stay up to date on what's coming down the pipe for March and you can get a good spot in line for the big blockbuster uh, spring catalog auction. So that's an auction that we're very excited about. We've got some absolutely incredible highlights in already. Uh, We've got five, six, seven figure cards already lined up for that auction. And uh, we're putting out a full color catalog. So six, 700 page catalog for that auction. So anyone that wants to go to our website, it's robertedwardauctions.com. You can bid and be view any of the auctions. You can sign up for email. You can sign up for a catalog and all that's free of charge. So uh, lots of opportunities to bid, lots of opportunities to consign too. If you've got anything that you want to sell, uh, you know we're happy to discuss it with you. We have a lot of opportunities to sell it quick. We have a lot of opportunities to sell it in one of our catalog auctions if it's a good fit. So uh, reach out however you want, social media, email phone call, snail mail. Uh, we'll be happy to work with you. Well, Brian, uh, once again, thank you for, for some of your time and uh, talking about, uh, you know, chopping up a little of the hobby and, and the auction world. Uh, continued success. I appreciate it. Thanks very much, John. All right. That was awesome having Brian uh, come on the show and we tackled some of uh, some of the stuff that's happened on the, the auction circuit, if you will. I don't know if that's an actual term or I just coined it that, but uh, the auction market and, uh, you know, we both agree, you know, tickets is something that uh, has got a lot of a lot of ceiling left, uh, I think. And uh, that guy's busy, so appreciate him uh, making some time for the show and happy that they're our, our official auction house sponsor of Sports Car Nation. Really uh, excited about that as well. Are you a new sports car collector or someone returning to the hobby? Maybe you're just looking for a friendly, trustworthy hobby community to hang out with and enjoy collecting. Midwest Box Brands has been bringing collectors together for many years with affordable breaks, helpful threads, and a Discord group packed with generous people who genuinely care about the hobby and other collectors. Check out the breaks at MidwestBoxBreaks.com. Our goal is to bring you as much value as possible. Also, find us on Twitter at Midwest Box Breaks. Hey folks, John here. Just wanted to remind you, use the discount code MBB10 for 10% off your first order at MidwestBoxBreaks.com. Check out our website at www.sportscardnationpodcast.com for the new release schedule, our blog, all show episodes, and so much more. Iron Sports Cards is your number one source for all your PSA and other grading submissions. Their elite status improves turnaround times. Heck, they even provide the card savers. Their chat rooms provide updates on all your submissions. They also offer wax options and single cards to cover all the bases. Check them out on Facebook at Iron Sports Cards Group or on the web at ironsportscards.com or even give them a call at 1-877-I-R-O-N-P-S-A. Rob's got you covered. That's a wrap on another edition of the Sports Card Nation podcast. Thank you to all the awesome listeners out there. Without you, there is no us. Thank you to all our great guests who drive this show and also our wonderful sponsors who help us produce the great hobby content every week. Remember, another Hobby Quick Hits episode drops every Monday and Sports Card Nation returns again next Friday. If you like the shows, we appreciate those positive reviews. Be well, and always remember, the hobby is the people.